Hi. Uh, hey, my name's Craig. This is the first time I've been to Osmo DevCon. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, having me here, and I've learned a ton of things from everybody, so I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, porting Osmocom BB to MediaTek chips. Um, I've been working on it for uh, a couple of years, maybe, maybe a year. Um, and so uh, about uh, eight or so years ago, I started working with Osmocom BB uh, on the Motorola phones. Uh, I was just trying to make myself a phone that I enjoyed more, uh, that was open. I wanted to know what was inside of it uh, and try to make a phone that was uh, less distracting. So, you know, not all the screen and the Android and the whatever else. Um, so uh, just some background on things I've done over the past eight years. Is I've messed around a lot with Android and pulling Zygote out. So that's the UI, the Java UI, and just you know, stop that process and then do like Jet Debian change root and some terminal stuff and CLI tools. Um, I did on this Moto Active Watch and a Geek's Phone key on. And then uh, I also messed around for a while trying to pull uh, layer one into NutX, which is something some other people worked on too, uh, NutX BB. Um, didn't really make a whole lot of progress there. Um, but in that, uh, currently the things I'm working on mostly uh, are, besides this are uh, uh, post-market OS, so just trying to make like a like a frame buffer console with some other things. I wrote a gesture recognition thing, kind of like uh, Palm Pilot Graffiti to work on that. Uh, so that's kind of background of the stuff that I have done. Um, so the uh, target devices uh, for what I'm working on, the first one is the Siphon Dream G2, which has a 6235 uh, chip inside of it that... Um, Previous people have developed a U-boot that uh, you can load into it. Uh, there's um, uh, Osmocon, or uh, in Osmocon BB, you can interact with a, a boot ROM uh, protocol that's available on most MediaTek chips. So you can uh, do things like read, write memory, load a big chunk into memory, as well as jump to an address in memory. Uh, so that's how, we, that's how they uh, kind of formulated a way to load uh, things into RAM and run them. And that's how they run U-Boot. Um, there was some code for uh, uh, just a loader uh, immediate in uh, Osmocom BB for that phone. Um, uh, Fernvale is a project uh, by uh, Bunny Huang and uh, Sean Cross. They developed an open hardware platform that includes the MediaTek 6260 chip. They spent some time reversing. It uses the same boot ROM protocol, so you can load uh, code into it and run it. Um, there's a little project called Fernly that interacts with a little program that they load to let you experiment with reading and writing and uh, manipulating this, uh, like a screen and things like that. Um, there's also lots of SIM 800 modules that have uh, 6260 or 6261, and they're, they're just barely different. Um, I have many watch phones that have a 6261 inside them. Um, my personal phone is, has a 6735 in it, uh, which um, I don't really have direct source for, but some kind of corollary source for it. It's 4G LTE, and then there's this newer uh, Orange Pi 4G IoT, which has almost the same chip as this thing. It's also 4G LTE, and, um, uh, and then there's some other leaked sources and stuff. I'll get to that in a second. So those are the target devices. My hope is to get stuff working on the Cyphone Dream G2, since there's a data sheet that's rather complete. Uh, I don't know of any other data sheets that are uh, complete for the other ships. Um, and then from there, move on to Fernvale and SIM 800. SIM 800, is, uh, you can buy that for like five to 10 bucks on eBay. So I think it'd be a really great platform for uh, people to kind of uh, you know, keep working on getting layer one, working on it, and different experiments that people want to do. Uh, this is my fancy org mode presentation. Um, OK, so what I've done so far. Um, <clears throat> so I've uh, kind of poked around on lots of different MediaTek devices with the Braum protocol. Um, I can interact with this phone and pull out of memory uh, where it keeps its config registers. And it tells me that it's got this 6735 chip. And 
I've got this uh, simple Python script that uh, I've kind of searched around on different devices to find that uh, config block in memory because it starts with like the the, the chip. Um, so that's this uh, simple serial uh, script that I wrote, part of somebody else's project, MTK Open Tools. Um, so I did that. Um, actually, okay. So the other thing I've done is I've uh, so Fernley uh, has support for uh, the serial uh, UART. Uh, actually, it's a serial over USB device in uh, 6260. And I took some of that code and a little bit of like a blinky light code that they had and put that into uh, uh, firmware for Osmocom. And uh, maybe I'll just uh, show that real quick, maybe. Um. So I, it's funny because I was describing some of these things, and then Powell had all these questions about, like, how does it work? <laughs> so, um, so let's see. I'll go uh, in their screen, and I'll oh, better make it bigger. Is that big enough? Maybe make it bigger. So, okay, that's probably big enough. All right. So on the column, on the column source. Um, oh, not that one. I want to go into Fernley. So uh, here's this is Fernley, and um, so this is um, the host program. Uh, this tells it to wait for the serial device to come up. This is the serial device. It's a USB serial device. Um, this is an initial uh, firmware that gets loaded inside the device that then lets them interact with it, uh, kind of like our uh, Osmo load stuff. And then the second one is a uh, a little bit more extensive firmware. You can just run that one by itself, and then it just automatically connects right here on the host, and then you can just type in read-write and different things like test the screen or uh, detect button pushes and things like that. And then the, you can also specify a third uh, ARG that's another firmware to load then uh, after that. And you can see here I've got uh, some firmware compiled for the 6260, uh, it says layer one. It's not layer one. <laughs> not hardly. <laughs> it, yeah, it wants to, yeah. Um, so then, let's see if I can get this to work. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> of course. <laughs> let's see if it's there or not. Uh, let's see. Ford, Ferndale. It's there. So what's the deal? Demo, gods, be nice. Cat, 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 cat. Yeah, that should be good. Oh, okay, I think I know what the deal is. Um, so uh, uh, I'll just do this real quick. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, that, that's probably the deal. Hopefully. Yeah, okay. Try this again. Yeah, okay, great. So now you can see that I'm sending out ones and zeros from the, serial, from the firmware, and it's blinky light. <laughs> I added in this too, which reads out the, the chip number out of the config block. Um, so, yeah. This is, is if, you, if you notice, this is not any one of the, uh, what is it, eight different training sequences. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I did actually um, uh, observe, I was trying to print out a whole bunch of debugging information via serial uh, when I was trying to bring up the RF system, and uh, it seemed like the things were out of order. Uh, so uh, there, maybe there's some problem there somewhere. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. So. So how do you make it load your custom firmware? How do you interrupt the regular booting process? Right. Yeah. I think a, a diagram of this would be pretty nice. Um, so there's a a boot ROM. Uh, and it's a, a like first stage bootloader. Um, if you uh, interact with the UART port in a certain way with some magic numbers, 
it initiates this protocol, and then you can read and write memory and jump to an address. So it just writes a block of uh, firmware into the RAM and then jumps to it. So. It's uh, something similar to what we have with Calypso phones. You Absolutely. briefly press this red button and, okay. Absolutely, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Okay, so that's uh, one thing I've done. Uh, another thing I've done is taken the uh, code that's in U-Boot. So in the U-Boot uh, code that they made for the Siphone Dream G2, there was a TXBurst kind of demo command that you could run. And I, uh, there was little bits of some uh, support for the transceiver chips in Osmocom already that they copied and put in there and added to, and then I took that and pulled it back into Osmocom. So now we have more uh, header files and things like that in my branch for, uh, for the MT6235. And so I got that TXBurst thing working back on the, in Osmocom firmware on the Siphone Dream G2. Um, and today, actually, Piotr helped me understand that uh, what that all that does right now is uh, it has the uh, the like the arm core controls the transceiver and uh, just turns it on to transmit. There's no DSP that's generating any kind of data yet, so that's the next thing I would probably work on there. Um, and then try to do another demo. Hopefully it's not too many demos. I mean, I figured demos are good, right? <sighs> Let's see. Okay, so here I'm going to uh, run this loader, which is going to load onto this Siphone Dream G2 I have here. It's kind of picky, so it doesn't always, it's all not always nice, but hopefully it'll work. Ah! Okay, that was just the antenna. Good. There we go. I can reconnect the antenna. I have to hold the button down on this device in order to get it to load all the firmware. <laughs> okay, so now it's loaded. can reconnect the uh, um, antenna that I have, which actually disables the antenna on the device. Um, and then I can interact with um, the device. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, you can see here I got a, a received a Pong, so I just ping Pong. And then I added the TXBurst as a command for uh, the MTK loader, just because it was the easiest way to get it in there. And, um, and actually, I need to start uh, the other bit here, this one, yeah. OK, so here I've got my SDR connected up with a couple of attenuators. And I uh, should be able to do uh, uh, transmit. And so if I change the ARFCN, you can see that it's going along in little chunks and it's something. So, and that's something that, you know, I really just copied the code uh, from, uh, from you back into Osmocom. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've been spending most of my time after I got this done uh, trying to understand every little bit of code. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so there's uh, another demo. That's that one. All right, so we'll go back to here. Um, so there's that bit. And what's that? Oh, t uh, well, it's it's yeah, it's it's all kind of it's uh, contained, right? It's not it's not on the air. It's uh, I had to I had to go find this uh, fancy connector somewhere that plugs in, so it turns off the antenna. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you. I, I was very concerned about that when I came here. I got like a, uh, a year or so ago, I got my uh, ham radio technician class license because in America, there's a 900 meter band that's uh, open for technician class license. Obviously not open for the kind of transmissions, but I thought I'd get a little bit legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There you go, fairly legal. Okay, um, so... Uh, yeah, so the ne next thing I've been working on a lot, uh, actually a while ago, I made a, uh, uh, there's, oh, okay, I should probably show this first. This is a, kind of a collection of all the leaked sources that I know about. So all those are either 6260 or 61. Um, and then there's also this one here, which is for 6795. It's quite a bit newer. Um, it's got 
things that look like um, baseband firmware for uh, LTE. So uh, it also has uh, some things that look like they interact with the transceiver that uh, they use with that, which is this MT6169. Um, so, you know, theoretically, if I can get enough information and it's similar enough, I could maybe do that same TX burst with the much newer uh, chips. Okay, so that's the... Uh, I don't want to go back up here. Um, yeah, so a while back, I took one of those uh, leaked sources and I made a little make file that... Um, I can define different chips. Uh, I include a whole bunch of stuff that I figured out. <laughs> and um, so a few more ifs and here and there. Um, and this allows me to not build uh, anything that I can run, but I, uh, I use save temps here. And that lets me, um, there's a lot of uh, if defs all over the place, tons. And so it was really hard to follow the code. So I did this to kind of follow the code. So I could, you know, look for the function I'm looking for, see what other functions it calls, try to figure out what addresses it was using for uh, registers and whatnot. So that was one strategy I used to try to figure things out. I did recently start to use uh, this uh, Ghidra uh, provided by the NSA um, so that I can reverse engineer. I, I, I don't know. This is my first uh, entry into reverse engineering, so I know that I should be using uh, IDA Pro, but I don't have that? Hmm? I, I, I've tried that a little bit, um, and it should be good for me because I, I actually use ED to do most of my editing, so it's, it's you know, similarly uh, obscure. Um, but, uh, um, so, and actually, I guess I was looking at some other stuff here. This, uh, I found this uh, function called... Uh, okay, so to explain this, one of the leaked sources has uh, a .l file that's got the symbols in it, and so this is what I'm uh, decompiling here. And um, I found this great function. It's L1D, which I think is layer one daemon, uh, DSP put t uh, transmit data. So this, sh this should be the function I need. It just be, uh, as Holger was saying the other day, it should just be easy. I just have to take this function and just, uh, you know, take the facts out and re-implement it, and it'll be easy. <laughs> Uh, but I started with um, this other, this one, L1D. You start with the init. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, I know. Well, and the thing is, like, uh, some amount of things are already initted with the code that people have already worked on. But I suspect that they didn't do anything with the DSP at all. So uh, I'm wondering if maybe, you know, so this is this L1D init, which is, Different than, so the code that already exists in that TX burst does some RF in it. Um, and there's a function called L1D RF in it. And what they did pretty much matches with what, with what the leak source code does, which I don't think probably includes like this one, which is the you know, DSP in it. And then later on, there's a, or well, there's a, yeah, there's the DSP in it. Oh, DSP wake up, that's the other one. So obviously there's some things here. Um, what I was looking in here for initially was the next step was going to be like try to get the device to sync with the BTS. So looking at um, the uh, frequency burst and like the FCCH and SCCH. So I uh, started trying to find that in the source code and there's just nothing there. So what I suspect is that the uh, leaked source code uh, doesn't have any of the C code that interacts with the DSP. I haven't really confirmed that yet. But I suspect it because I found a lot of references to things that aren't available in C files. Um, and so looking here, I'm hopeful that by looking through here and maybe I can get, and actually I think I got that TXT. Oh, I was doing a search for L1D DSP and that's how I found that uh, transmit data stuff. So yeah, so I'm looking through this. I'm going to look through this and uh, try to figure out what it's doing. I, f I found some one really exciting discovery is that a lot of the DSP code is manipulating an address that I've never seen referenced anywhere. So that's uh, kind of exciting because I feel like there's probably just a whole block of uh, registers that are uh, communicating with the DSP. So that's kind of exciting to kind of know where it is, <laughs> even though I don't know what it is. Uh, let's see, what else? 
Uh, yeah, so the leak sources. Um, and then, so that there is a uh, data sheet for the 6235 that um, pretty uh, well describes these two interfaces to um, the transceiver, I think. Uh, the, so the baseband serial interface and baseband parallel interface. The way I understand, uh, I, I don't actually know what the, the system on chip architecture is precisely. Uh, there's certainly an ARM core. I don't know if there's a separate uh, core. I, I, I'm not much of an expert with hardware, so a sep maybe a separate core for baseband or not, but I, I think there's not. I think there might be an ARM core, a DSP core inside the SOC, and then outside that is the transceiver uh, chip. That's kind of my idea right now. So this BSI and BPI, which is a parallel interface, interact with the transceiver, and this is what that TX burst is using to configure the transceiver to open things up. Serial, right? Uh, both. So there's baseband serial interface and baseband parallel interface. Um, the way I understand it right now is that um, for both of these, there's a, uh, a TDMA-driven mode that you can use. Uh, but there, and there's also a immediate mode that can be used, and the code currently is using uh, the immediate mode. And um, like the TX burst, uh, when they initialize things and when they uh, do the burst, they have a lot of uh, things where they they wait a little bit of time uh, based on the TDMA clock. So they, they wrote a function to basically pull the TDMA clock and wait, you know, five qubits or something. Uh, depending on, and, and those numbers that they put in there are, I don't even know what they are. I tried to add them up, try to match them with some uh, particular burst type, and it just, I don't even know what it is. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, configuration in the source, and um, I also found a uh, GSM Layer 1 um, document. It's like a, here's how you interact with the Layer 1 firmware document for MediaTek. Um, that I had not seen until like a month ago. And that had a whole bunch of really interesting information. It uh, describes uh, a whole bunch of kind of like timing diagrams, the TDMA, and various uh, like tuning adjustments that you can make for the basic uh, uh, timing of different things inside of layer one of their firmware. So, and I found the .h files for different uh, transceiver chips where they have a big chunk of, you know, qubit timings for different aspects of uh, transmission and reception. Ramp up, ramp down, stuff like that. Um, yeah, and the parallel access is like, um, just like kind of immediate, uh, like uh, on off, uh, directly connected to the pins of the transceiver. So like in the transmit, there's one where you uh, turn on the, the PA or uh, something like that. Um, yeah, and so I, I have a whole bunch of notes on uh, like what all the code means in the transmit burst. Um, and um, I've done the static analysis like I was showing with the Ghidra. Um, my plan is to uh, probably work on the, the um, synchronization with the BTS, uh, the kind of RX stuff next. And uh, I definitely want to take the many, many pages of notes that I have and uh, coalesce them into uh, wiki entries and stuff on the Osmocom site. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it for the real things that I've done that aren't uh, vaporware. I have lots of vaporware ideas, so I'll share those for another time. So that's it, right? It's fun, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ah, no. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. First off, um, uh, thanks for for the presentation and uh, continuing the work that started. I mean, nine <laughs> years ago when, when first looking at the MediaTek yeah. uh, platform. And um, 
what, what I just remembered from from back then is that um, there's this. I think there was a separate firmware for calibration purposes. This Cal K A L uh, stuff, I think. Okay. Which uh, implements a rather minimal um, layer one. So maybe. Oh, okay. It's easier to to look at this. And that's a like a binary somewhere or. Uh, uh, I think so, and there okay. were also, I think, um, yeah, relinkable objects somewhere with uh, debug information. Oh, also. okay, yeah. And uh, um, so because it's a lot, yeah, yeah. simpler. Right, so yeah. All, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. Cool, okay. awesome. Um, so... Uh, Maybe it's a hypothetical future. But I was just thinking, so it's maybe a next step or a lot of steps <laughs> afterwards. Uh, so at some point, so now we are running uh, layer one only in, in there, but so it seems like actually you can run a lot of stuff there, like as in a mobile phone, let's say. Yeah. So at some point, if uh, I guess you can run even Linux there. So I, I'm just wondering... Uh, what what would be the interface like? So in, in if you basically run uh, layer one... Uh, on yeah, on on the same uh, sock with uh -huh. Linux. So, uh, is there some uh, some kind of interface available for this kind of communication, or we should create one? Or uh, what do you mean by interface? You mean? Well, I mean, uh, so you want to communicate uh, probably uh, from user space to the kernel, and then the kernel has to set up some registers or whatever, I guess. Or you mean like on the device? Yeah. Okay. Like to yeah, I mean, I certainly complete, thought complete of like on the two two things. Uh, certainly, I I felt like it might be important to maintain the ability to run like the mobile app on the host and do experiments like that. Uh, so maintain that kind of Osmocon uh, connection there. And then, um, uh, yeah, certainly I would plan on trying to run something, some OS like NutX. Uh, I think the 62, 60, and 1 uh, maybe don't have enough uh, something to run Linux. Um, uh, so maybe it would be NutX, I don't know. They already have NutX for it. The Bunny and Chris, uh, Sean, did that. Um, so, yeah, the plan would be definitely to have a usable uh, system just on the phone. Yeah? If I can add to that, I think, of course, it's like talking about step 30 before. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, since the protocol between the layer one and layer two and higher is right now spoken over UART, uh, you could actually have the layer one in the kernel and then have something like a serial, a virtual serial port to user space. Right. So you can run the unmodified uh, mobile program uh, on, on user space, talking not over a real serial line to a remote processor, but really talking to over a virtual serial port to the local layer one inside the kernel, but yeah, yeah that's yeah. That that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that maybe at some point uh, there would I would do something in a phono, for example. I don't know. I don't. I I'm not going to do much. Uh, the, my goal is to make a phone that I like, and the phone that I like is extremely minimal. So I'll do the bare minimum, um, especially if it's also helpful to to others. And you know, somebody else can take that serial port and making a phono adapter or something so that it can be used for people that want a UI. So. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah.